Now that's a fine looking ottoman. I want to tell you about it. I, uh, I wanted to bring the chair and ottoman, uh, but wouldn't fit in the car this morning, at least not with the kids. It was either them or the... So anyways, went with just the ottoman, that fit in the trunk, and um, I want to tell you about this. I like chairs. I like to sit. I like chairs that are comfortable. I like being comfortable. This is an Eames chair. Specifically, this is an Eames ottoman. And you can see it pictured up here. Now, to give you a little history of this chair, it was designed by mid-century designers Charles and Ray Eames. That's them there. An American couple whose designs are recognized and celebrated the world over. Now... This chair, this ottoman, was designed in 1950 and has the distinction of being one of the only pieces of furniture that is on permanent display in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. So, it's a work of art, whether you think it's ugly or not. Only two manufacturers in the world are licensed to produce these chairs today. The Herman Miller Company, based out of Michigan, in the United States, and a company called Vitra, which is a European company. Now, these are hard to find. Uh, they're, they're sought after because they're, they're sort of rare. Not, not too many of them are produced anymore. Here's the thing. I wanted to bring this in to prove a point, or at least to help illustrate a point. And the point is this. This... Ottoman and the chair that matches it are not real Eames chairs and ottoman. It's not real. It's an imitation. It doesn't bear this mark. You can kind of see it in the one ad there. And then I've got a picture of the actual Herman Miller stamp that is found on genuine Eames chairs and specifically this chair and ottoman. Anything that is genuine, that is the real deal, a real Eames design, has that stamp. This does not. Nothing on there. Nothing but plywood. So, in our passage that Stephen read for us this morning, Jesus implies that there are real disciples and fake disciples. These last few weeks, we've been talking about the badge of discipleship. And we've seen in Scripture that the mark of a true disciple of Jesus Christ is love. Agape. We've looked at what that means. We talked about, first of all, that, that we, as his followers, are called to love with the love of God, agape being sacrificial, defining the love of God himself. We're to love God first, then we're to love each other, the church, as Christ has loved us, and then we are to show that love to this world, the people of the world, as we talked about last week. But in our passage this morning, Jesus points out another important mark of a true disciple. Now, to put this passage in context... At the beginning of the chapter, chapter 8, Jesus offers grace and forgiveness to the woman caught in adultery. And then the next time he teaches, he gets into this heated discussion with the Jewish leaders about his claims to be of God, the Son of God specifically. Now keep this in mind. Mentioned this before, but the purpose of John's gospel, the, the reason why John writes, he sums up, In chapter 20, verse 31, where we read, these are written, these words, these stories, these things are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's the purpose for writing, so that people might come to faith in Jesus Christ and be saved, have eternal life. And the thing is, here in John 8... It seemed to be happening. A lot of people were believing and coming to faith in Jesus. We'll pick up 
this again. Stephen read this, but just to review, verse 30, chapter 8, even as Jesus spoke, many put their faith in him. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. In verse 31, the word translated really is the Greek word alethos, which means certainly, surely, demonstrably valid, and therefore genuine. In other words, there are real disciples, Jesus is saying, and on the flip side, there are fake disciples. There's discipleship that's merely outward, but real discipleship goes down to the root, down to the heart. And so this morning, we're going to consider what it means to be Jesus' true disciples. And in turn, we need to ask ourselves a really hard question. Are we? Do we line up with what his word teaches us? It's kind of an upsetting thought, isn't it? Why does Jesus bring this up? Well, verse 30 says, as he spoke, many put their faith in him. You see, there had been this big response to Jesus' teaching. The Jesus bandwagon was getting pretty full. And whenever a lot of people respond like that, you you need to be skeptical. You need to be careful. Good chance that that some of those people were just going along with the crowd, just along for the ride. So Jesus presents the people with an if-then statement to determine if their belief is real. In fact, it's an if-then-then statement. There's two thens here. If you hold to my teaching, verse 31 there, if you hold to my teaching then, although it's not there in the text, you are really my disciples. Second then, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So being real disciples, true disciples of Christ, means being set free by the truth. But it's at this point in the middle of Jesus' teaching that that the Jews interrupt him. Hold on a second, Jesus. Hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? In other words, they're saying, we don't need to be set free. Jesus, we're already free. We're God's chosen people. (sighs) Descendants of Abraham over here. But the reality was the Jews were in bondage. They were under Roman rule, only free to the limits that the Roman authorities had placed upon them. They'd completely missed Jesus' point here. See, Jesus was not talking about national independence or personal freedom. He was talking about their spiritual freedom. He was talking about the the state of their souls. It's been said that uh, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. Jesus said, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. See, the word truth is similar to the word really, aletheia. And it means truth in in the moral sphere, sphere. Truth, divine truth. The divine truth revealed to man. And guess what? It's the same word Jesus uses to describe himself in John 14, 6, when he says, I am the way, the truth, aletheia, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth. Now, look at 
He says, then you will know the truth. The word know, really interesting, important word. It's not head knowledge Jesus has in mind here. This is a knowledge of experience, a personal, intimate knowledge. It's used in Luke 134 when when Mary is talking to the angel, and she's questioning, hey, how can I be with child? I've never known a man. Sexual intimacy, it's a deep word. And Jesus is saying, then you will know, personally, experientially know the truth. Me. And the truth will set you free. But the Jews miss it. Totally miss it. So Jesus spells it out. He connects the dots for them in verses 34, 35, and 36. I tell you the truth, okay? Let's try this again. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, if the son, Jesus, sets you free, you will be free indeed. A true disciple of Jesus recognizes their desperate need to be forgiven and set free from their sin which is only possible by repenting of our sin and turning in faith to Jesus Christ, the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us to forgive us our sins and indeed to set us free through his atoning sacrifice on the cross. Why? So that we might know God personally and experientially. That's the only way to be set free. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, being set free from sin is the result of being a true disciple of Jesus, but that only happens if. If something. If is the criteria Jesus gives for what a true disciple looks like. If you hold to my teaching, if you hold to my teaching, in the Greek, the word translated hold means to cling to, to to persevere, to never let go, not only to hold for today, but to hold tomorrow and to remain in and to abide in. That's how other versions read this. Abide in my word, Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching. Our son Theodore was born with incredible grip strength. Uh, we, we learned this when he was just a little guy in his crib, and uh, we, we'd have a blanket over him, and, and we would go to adjust the blanket, and he would fall asleep grabbing this blanket. And at first you think, okay, it's, you know, it's a security blanket, you know, just grab it. It's, it kind of gives him, you know, soothes him. We go to move it, and his arm goes along, like I'm pulling the blanket, and his arm just goes along with it. It got to the point, I, as he's sleeping, I could lift up the blanket, and like as he's sleeping, literally, like I could almost lift him right out of his crib, hanging to his blanket because he is, he is holding it, holding, clinging to his blanket, Here, Jesus is saying, keep on clinging to, what? His teaching. That's how it's translated. If you want to know Jesus, the best way to get to know him is through his teaching, through the word of God. We must hold on to it, abide in it, read it, obey it, believe it, and keep on believing it. Keep on reading it. Keep on clinging to it. That's what Jesus is saying here. Except there's more to it than that. It's not just his teaching. The word translated teaching, it's singular, and it's the word logos. And it's the word Jesus uses, sorry, the word John uses of Jesus at the very beginning of the gospel when he writes, uh, there, in the beginning was the word, logos, Jesus. And the word was with God, and the word, logos, was God. Jesus was God. What did Jesus teach? Jesus taught a lot of different things, didn't he? He said, I'm the bread of life. I am the light of the world. 
I'm not of this world. I'm the good shepherd. I am in the Father. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everything Jesus taught pointed to Jesus, pointed to God. Jesus is the word, logos, from the beginning, one with God. So when Jesus says, cling to my teaching, he is saying, in essence, cling, hold to, abide in, persevere in me. This is known as the doctrine of perseverance. That's your theological term for the morning, or the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, which means on the flip side, put in negative terms, if you do not hold to my word, if, if you let go, you're not really my disciples then you will not know the truth, know the truth, know the truth, and the truth cannot set you free. So hold on. Does that mean that, that if, I, if I stumble and fall, if I let go of Jesus' teaching for a little while and, and kind of backslide, does that mean I'm not saved? What about our eternal security? I I thought, uh, once saved, always saved. You've heard that expression? The Bible clearly teaches that true disciples will endure to the end by the power of God. But here's the thing. The idea of once saved, always saved misrepresents the doctrine of perseverance, perseverance of the saints. You see, it's unfortunately been used by so-called Christians sometimes immature Christians, sometimes unsaved disciples. They use that as a license to sin. Abiding in Jesus, continuing to hold to his teaching, continuing to persevere doesn't save us, but it shows we are saved. You catch that? It's part of our assurance of salvation that we continue to hold on to the word of God to continue to obey, to continue to trust and believe. John Piper um, describes it this way. He writes, eternal security is not like a vaccination that we receive when we were six and don't have anything to do with now. No, it's like an ongoing therapy regimen and our doctor, Jesus, promises never, never, never to leave us but always to help us and to keep us and thus our ongoing daily therapy is the means by which we are preserved and kept and his words are an essential part of that. He goes on, so our part is to continue to trust him every day that he knows what he's doing through this sometimes very painful therapy. Sadly, the reality is many disciples let go. They, they turn away. Thus showing that they were never true disciples. I've seen it many times in 14 years of ministry here. I'll never forget receiving a call telling me of of a former student, a student that we had poured time and energy into, a student who had so much potential, who who seemed to love the Lord and, and have a passion for serving God and for sharing his word and telling others the good news. And years later, he'd gone off to school and I got this call telling me that, uh, no, he's done with the Christian thing. Turned out he, he never really believed it. He was going through the motions. I'm sure you know of stories like that. It's nothing new. John 6 ends with the defection of many of Jesus' disciples. After teaching them that unless they ate his flesh and drank his blood, they could have no life in them, Jesus says, here, 
What does he say? Here's what he says. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. And then we read from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Jesus uses the same word for disciple there as he does, as we read in, in John 8. Many of his disciples, Methedes, turned back. They abandoned not just the teaching of Jesus, but the teacher himself. The word translated disciple, it, it's a simple word. It just means learner, student. It doesn't really tell us anything about the person other than they're absorbing this experience. But here's the thing. Jesus had many disciples, many, but few true disciples. Just because you look like a disciple and talk like a disciple, it, it doesn't make you a true disciple. This is a fake Eames Ottoman. Even though it looks almost exactly like the original, even though it's comfortable and and it moves the same way, it's not genuine. Is it an Eames? Yeah. Is it a real Eames? True Eames? No. Because it doesn't hold to the original blueprint that the Eames created. In John 8, 31, the blueprint for discipleship, the criterion for a true disciple is abiding in, holding to Jesus' word, logos, which is Jesus himself, which is why when we come to John 15, that we'll close with this morning, Jesus doesn't just say, abide or remain or hold to me. Or sorry, hold to my word. He actually says, hold to me, remain in me, abide in me. Not just my word, in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Jesus is the vine. His followers, his disciples are the branches. And Jesus says, God the Father is the gardener who prunes the fruitful branches so that they'll bear more fruit. And what does he do with the ones that don't? He cuts them away. Those who who don't really believe, those who are outwardly following Jesus for a time but fail to abide, fail to bear fruit, he throws them away into the fire and they're burned. I think there's three important elements for us to fully understand what it means to abide in Jesus Christ and thus show ourselves to be his true disciples. Number one, we need to be connected to the vine. Connection. A branch is connected to the vine, the vine to the branch. Abiding in Jesus means having that life-giving connection. Theological term would be union with Christ. Notice this connection, this union, this relationship, it's reciprocal, it's mutual. We abide in him and he abides in us. If there's no connection to Christ, there's there's no life. The branch dies, it has to be connected. Number two, reliance. See, unlike connection, reliance, we rely on the vine. We rely on Jesus. He doesn't rely on us. We have to rely on him. The branch draws its life and power from the vine. Without the vine, the branch is lifeless, powerless, useless. We are completely reliant on Jesus for everything that counts as spiritual fruit. And without him, we can do nothing, we read. Finally, as I've already mentioned, perseverance. Perseverance is the third thing, which I've already mentioned. It means continuing to trust in Jesus, continuing to hold on to, to depend on him. We never stop believing. We never stop trusting or obeying. To abide in Christ is to persevere in Jesus, in his teaching, no matter what comes our way in life. 
as hard as it is, even when it seems like God is nowhere to be found, we hold to his teaching and thus show ourselves to be his true disciples. How do we do this? We abide in Jesus by abiding in his love, as we see in verses 9 and 10. We do that by holding to his teaching and, what does it say? Obeying his commands. Look it. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain, abide in my love. Just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. As we've seen these past three weeks, to keep his commands means to love God with all our hearts, souls, and minds. To love our neighbors as ourselves and moreover to love each other as Christ has loved us. True disciples, abide in Jesus and his love by obeying his commands. That's one part of it. But he abides in us through his word and by his Holy Spirit. Let's not forget the Holy Spirit. A chapter earlier in John 14, Jesus promises his disciples, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you to abide. He goes on to promise this, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. We're not on our own, my friends, to try to cling to this by ourselves. If we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit is in us abiding and helping us to do what Jesus promises here, to remember, to cling to, to obey. Remind us of everything that he said. The spirit of truth. Abiding in Jesus means holding to his word, keeping it in our hearts and minds so that we are continually being renewed, continually being revived, shaped, sanctified, filled, and formed more and more into the image of Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit who abides in those of us who believe and who helps us to abide in him and his infinite love, agape love. Here's the deal. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, a true disciple, may God, through his word, strengthen your faith and encourage your heart as you continue to hold to his teaching, as you continue to hold to him through faith and abide in the word. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, or maybe this morning if you've realized you've been kind of going through the motions You've been maybe playing church more than being a real disciple of Christ. May you come to see through these passages what a real disciple, a true Christian is, and repent of your sin. Turn in faith to Jesus Christ. Be set free from your sins and abide in him, he in you today and tomorrow and forever. True disciples of Jesus abide in his word. Persevere, hold to his teaching. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, true disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this word, Lord. God, it's, uh, it's a bit of a mirror this morning, but a mirror, God, that we need to look into and look at the reflection back. And Father, if, if we don't line up, help us, Lord. We thank you that as we started off with love, God, that you are our God who so loved us, agape. And God, that love knows no bounds. We thank you for that love that has saved us and set us free. And Father, has saved us to follow you. And we thank you that you promise us and give us your Holy Spirit to be with us, to help us follow you and remain in you and abide in you and to never turn back. 
Father, if there's any here this morning who need to take that step and cry out to you, ask you to come in to their hearts, to place their faith in Jesus Christ who loved us and died on the cross to save us, to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that he rose from the dead to give us eternal life through faith. God, I pray that they would take that step today, Father. Ask you into their lives to be saved, to be set free, to become a true follower a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name I pray, amen.